morning. Good morning. What a beautiful day it's going to be. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for the rain, and thank you for stopping it, and thank you for the fact that we don't have to shovel it. Would you stand with, yeah, would you stand with us, please, singing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, and angels prostrate.
Heavenly Father, we come to you today grateful for the rain, grateful for the weather that you're giving us, grateful for the opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters and praise your name. Be with each person today. May we be an inspiration to someone. Bless the ones that are leaving. Keep them safe as they travel. Be with Jeremiah as he gives the message. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 But before you sit down, greet someone, welcome them today, because you might not see them for the rest of the summer. So, you know, one of the things is, so we, we at the Lions Church, we like to do a lot of things that really try to um, build fellowship between people. But one of the things is, is as we worship, one of the things I love to think about is you're not just worshiping by yourself. Um, you're worshiping with the person next to you. You're praising God together, but not just them, but people down the road people in the next state over, people in the next country over. As we worship together, we're actually one body worshiping Christ. And Amen. so that's what we're doing here. And so it's, Amen. we're not just building relationships here, we're building relationships eternally through our worship. So, um, but we like to celebrate each other. Um, so if you had a birthday from yet last Monday to today, we'd like to sing to you. And it looks like someone up in our sound booth. Uh. Oh, she forgot to stand up. So, yeah, there's some more. Do you both have one? No, just her. Oh, just you. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Come on over here, too, Sheena. Yes, thank you for letting me, or letting us, letting, just me, just me. It was just me singing the whole time. Um, celebrate your birthdays. May you have a great birthday this, um, hopefully it was great, and that this week would be blessed, and that people next to you that point you out will bless you too, okay? So God bless you. Thank you for letting us sing to you. Uh, anyone that was, here, I got you. Go, go, go. Don't forget Larry. Um, don't forget, uh, anyone Larry. that had an anniversary from last Monday to today, we'd like to on, guys. Um, sing to you. Oh. No? No, no I, th I, thought, I thought I saw some movement. All right. <laughs> All right, well, that's the second time in today we did not have any anniversaries. Yeah. yeah. This we first service, so this weeks. service. Man, people get married. All right. I know, February's not popular. It's not a very popular mm -hmm. month. <laughs> um, everyone got married last week. Um, um, so, w what's next? New people. Um, if, for some reason, you're here for the first time, um, you decided to come and spend your time with us instead of fishing, um, we're glad that you're here. Um, and we would just like to know where, you, where you're from, your first name, and your place of origin, <laughs> um, because we just like to know where he comes from. Um, who was born here in Quartzsite? <laughs> See that? No one. Nobody. No one was born here. So we're all transplants. So if this is your first time here or it's your first time back, um, we just want to know your first name and where you're from. That's all we want to dig out of you for now. Okay. All right. Washington area. All right. Welcome, Tina. <laughs> See? See, it's not that bad. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Jim, who is going to saunter over. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Am I happy to be here? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Get to it. I won't mention the office is closed Monday. Okay. Yeah. Tuesday. Huh? That was last Monday. You got the wrong one? <laughs> you, want to you want me to announce that? <laughs> okay. Um, let me start over. Tuesday, TOPS meeting at 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. over here on, did I say Tuesdays? Yeah. 
There's a ladies' Bible study on Tuesday also at 1 p.m. Uh, v. Adkins is teaching it, and it is really a good one. You, you ladies would like to come up for that. It's at 1 p.m. on Tuesdays again. Wednesday, the apologetics class meets over there at 6 p.m. Thursdays, ladies' quilting, 9 a.m. over there. And Friday, teen rec night somewhere. And again, the invitation is there if you want to come out and join them. Anybody here? Just a show of hands. <laughs> the kids will be back today, tonight. They'll be back tonight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, Saturday breakfast at the eatery. Also, we're going to do another Roadrunner um, this Friday, and we're going to go to a place called Ramsey Mine. It's over east, uh, just before you get on the Highway 60, and just before you get to Brenda, it's off to the south of the freeway. Um, we'll meet at Riggles and Kewen down, not too far from the uh, Mormon church. Riggles and Kewen will sign up, start signing up at 9 o'clock, and at 9.30 we'll take off. Okay, don't have far to go this time. And uh, bring chairs, bring food, your, whatever you want to eat. Always make a fire. It's not a camp without a fire. We have a good time. It, and I, I'm, I have the old, um, do it, start the fires the old way. I have kindling and the squirt the juice on it. <laughs> and the <laughs> put those Indians to shame. <laughs> no, I don't know who Flynn is. I've heard about him. But okay, <laughs> moving on. Okay, Roadrunners Friday, meet down there at nine. We'll sign up, and at nine thirty we'll head over there. We have a good. We had a good time. We had twenty people last uh, Friday, and I didn't know anything about the mine that we went to except that it was there, and we did see a graveyard. Isn't that cool? <laughs> okay. Um, Nancy has an announcement that she would like to make. You're not taller than I am. I just want to thank everybody who helped volunteer for the rummage sale. I can't remember everybody's name, so I'm not going to name names, but we had people that worked Thursday morning or Thursday to set up. That was like four hours, and then they worked Friday and Saturday all day and helped pack up. Thank you guys so much. That's so huge. And, um, you know, I think the kids that we do these things for really don't recognize the value. I hope they recognize the value later when they come back. But if you've been coming to the church for a long time, you've seen these kids from the time they were real little. And now they're, they're grown up and they're in high school and they're going off to college and they're coming back and they're really making a, an impact in the community. And this church has a lot to do with that. It kind of chokes me up about it because I think it's there's not much here in town for these kids to do. And they get so much mentoring and positive examples from you guys just by being here and saying hi to them and the other things that you do. And when they see us supporting something that's going to benefit them and then they come back and benefit the community and the things that they learn and the values that they learn, it's huge. So you guys that volunteer, you really, really are doing a big deal. It may not seem like a big deal to you, but you really are. So thank you. Okay, you see this one? You all have it, one of these in your bulletin. Uh, the Foresters a group of singers. I'd never heard them. Jeremiah's listened to their uh, tapes, whatever. It says they're really good. Tonight at 6 p.m. here... Be here early, get a good seat. Um, the Foresters, that's all the information we have on it. Unless, okay. Any other question? Any, anybody have a question? Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for your mercies. Father, we thank you that you have loved us so much that you gave your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in our place that we might have eternal life with you through him. Father, we thank you for that great and wonderful gift. Father, we just pray that you continue to bless each and every one of us. Those who are traveling, keep them safe on the road. Those who in the military, stationed abroad, wherever. 
Father, put your angels around them too, and our police officers, our law enforcement, protect them, Father, keep them safe. And now as we get into the rest of the service, we pray that you would open Jeremiah's heart and uh, teach us new and wonderful things that we did not know. And Father, just open our hearts to that we would receive them with thanksgiving and thereby bless you more. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. So speaking of kids, uh, my daughter's in the service today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make fun of her now. Um, um, so one of the great things about having children um, is that, she's hiding now, um, is the fact that you get to be referee between them. So how many of you have ever had a child or looked at a child or been around a child and had to deal with something where all of a sudden you just hear this <laughs> and uh, ah! And, uh, and then you say, oh man. <laughs> so, yeah. And so this is a common occurrence, right? This is going in and you have children and the closer they are, the se- it, it seems like me and my sisters never had problems growing up. Never. No, we, we really didn't because um, my oldest, I have two sisters. My oldest one is 14 years older than me, um, and my other one's seven years older than me. So we, we never had problems because half the time we were all, well, at least me, I was an only child, basically. And so I never really had problems with them. And so, but with my children, they're all within like three years of each other. Okay, and it is constant. <laughs> well, not constant. It's every d- moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> and it's just you know you hear something in the back and you're just going man. But then you get back and this is I love my children. I love you, Elizabeth. I love you very much. Um, but <laughs> um, the one thing that drives me nuts with my children is the fact that. When you walk into a situation and you know you're going to have to referee, you know you're going to have to do something, and then you explain, you find out, right, everything that went wrong. Okay, you smacked them, you pushed them off the bed, you did this, right? And then that was wrong. And the inevitable question from the mouth of the person that did it wrong is, why? Why was that wrong? And at this point, in my mind, I'm thinking, do I really need to tell a a six-year-old the complexities of morality and why this is wrong, right? But as as soon as I open my mouth, I know their mind is gone. They're off into where can I play next. They're done with this whole thing. They've moved on, and they're just, they're already gone. And so I'm thinking, how can I explain this in a simple way, right? And I love scripture because scripture, Jesus makes it so simple that both children and adults can understand morality very simply. And it's from uh, Mark chapter 12, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he responds, love the, yeah, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he adds, love your neighbor as yourself. A very simple concept. And it really encapsulates all of morality. That, that morality is this idea that there is good and evil. And we talk about morality and the things, when we usually talk about morality, we're usually talking about this idea of the things that happen, right? Something is wrong or it's right. Is murder wrong or right? Is um, abortion wrong or right? You know, we talk about these things in these kind of right and wrong ideas. But we started last week this concept of there are arguments for God, for the existence of God. And last week we talked about the fine-tuning argument. This week we're going to talk about the moral argument and how the moral argument, this idea of morality, actually points us to God. And so last week um, 
we talked about more or we talked about the fine tuning argument. And in the fine tuning argument, we talked about how our universe and our world in particular is fine tuned for inhabitants, right? That we can inhabit this world. And so that idea of being in a world, in a universe that can be habitable is this, is this idea that where does that come from? If it appears to be created, then who created it, right? And so we saw from Scripture that the God of the Bible says, I did. I created this universe. And so we talked about that last week. But if we took that part out, just the fine-tuning of the universe points us to something bigger, right? Points us to something beyond the creation that created it, okay? And I want us to understand that because this week we're going to kind of do the same thing. We're going to go both from Scripture and from this idea that without this separate entity that we wouldn't even have morality. So we'll talk about that. So this is what we're talking about today. Morality, when we usually have conversations with people, and this is, happens to me all the time, when I have conversations and we talk about right and wrong, ethics, these types of ideas, the first thing people will say to me is, well, I'm just as good as you. And I always respond with this. You are probably, yeah, you are. You probably are as good as me. In fact, you're probably better. Because I'm not a very good person. And I actually share those stories with you. I'm going to share a story with you right now about my children. <laughs> Yesterday, I, there's some stuff um, out there. And I, um, if you go out that door, we have a ton of stuff. And there's a pile of trash that we have to take to the, the dump. And I told my children, as, as we're working here yesterday, do not go into that pile of trash. You could get hurt. There's a bunch of things that could cut you open. And so I leave. I come back. Guess where they are? <laughs> of course not. They would never do something like that. My children are perfect. <laughs> yes, they were in the trash. So I go, get out of the trash. They get out of the trash. I come back. Guess where they're at? The in the trash. Then, a little later, I tell them to get out of the trash, right? Then a little later, we're trying to put that tarp on, and the wind is just blowing like crazy. My, my daughter starts running towards the trash. It's like, I'm not even standing there. And so I go like this, get out of here. <laughs> you know. And, but just this idea that I'm not a very good person. <laughs> Um, and so, but when I talk to people and we talk about goodness, right, and they say, well, I'm just as good as you, the reality is, yeah, you probably are a better person than I am. I'm not disputing that, but that's not the moral argument. The moral argument isn't about, or well, it doesn't start with, is something right or wrong? It starts with, what is the foundation of that belief? Because think about it. If we start looking across the world, a lot of morality is very similar between all the cultures, right? In fact, um, I just shared that verse from Mark 12, right, where Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, within Buddhism, there's a, a little saying that goes along that same way, except the difference is it says, do unto others as they would want you to do. And this idea is very similar to the biblical idea. The only difference is uh, who's the focus, right? And when Jesus says it, it's do unto others as you would have them do to you. Where in Buddhism, it's do unto others as they would want it to be done to them. So but it's very similar. So this morality, this idea of morality is across the world, right? And so this idea of goodness, okay, but what is the, why do we have that? Why in our societies do we even have morality? And so that's the question. Now, for, for a Christian, it can be very simple, right? But really, there's only two basic ideas of why there's morality. There's either because we were created with it or because we developed it. There's only two ideas. And so I want to share with you, today I'm going to share with you a lot of, of quotes, like I did last week. This one comes from this guy named Luke uh, Muehlhauser, 
And he is an atheist. Um, he's a speaker, and he's an atheist. And he wrote this, um, he has a website called Common Sense Atheism. And he had this interaction that he told about after a, a particular speech he gave at UCLA. And afterwards, they have a, usually you have a, a Q&A session, and someone stood up, and it was a Christian woman, and asked him a question. So he wrote this, and this is how he remembers it. He says, the girl, walk, the girl stood up and asked, without God, how can you have any morality? This is how he remembers. He says, the most skeptical audience laughed as if it was a stupid question. Geez, not that again. And he responds with, well, it's not a stupid question. It is a very good, important, difficult question. Because this idea of you only have two options, and when you take God out of the equation and say that morality is constructed by us over a time, that's a really hard thing to deal with. And so he says that, but for the Christian, it's not because we have God. God is the reason why we have morality. In fact, it's not that God says moral things. Okay, It's not that he says murder is wrong. It's not that he says that um, lying is wrong. It's not that he says it, but rather God's goodness is who he is. Does that make sense? It's not that he just says it, but that that is exactly who he is. That the person of God is good. And so we have this in a lot of different places in Scripture. Here's a couple of them. This comes from Psalm 25, verse 8. It says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. Okay? So this Psalm 25, just this idea that God is good, okay, and, it, and he is upright, and that he instructs people. So he is good, and from his goodness, that's where he commands. That's where he instructs. Okay? This one comes from Mark 10. Mark 10, 18. Um, Jesus is approached, and we call the guy um, the rich young ruler, and he is approached, and Jesus, or he tells Jesus, good teacher, and Jesus responds like this. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And Jesus is making this, this very pointed response that only God is good, so why do you call me good? It's an it's a implied question, right? And it's an implied answer. But the idea there is that God is good, that that's who God is, all right? The last one, James 1.17. James 1.17, he says about God, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And so this idea that God isn't this person that shifts from good to evil or um, is one day one way and another day another day, another thing. Instead, that God is constant in his goodness. And from God, goodness flows. And so this idea that God is good is the basis for Christian morality. It's not the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the things that God spoke to say these are the good things. But the foundation to, to morality is God himself. Does that make sense? Okay. But the question becomes, what happens when you take God out? Right? Where does morality go then? Okay, so here's some um, quotes from some atheists. This first one comes from a guy named David Silverman. He was having a debate with a Christian apologist named David, uh, named um, Frank Turk, and this is what he said in the debate. There is no objective moral standard. We are responsible for our own actions. The hard answer is it, or moral decisions, is a matter of opinion. Yeah, you see that? You take God out, and the morality becomes an opinion. All right? Another guy named John Steinrucken, in his book Secularism's Ongoing Debt to Christianity, he wrote this, Those who doubt the effect of religion on morality should seriously ask the question, just what are the immutable moral laws of secularism? Be prepared to answer, if you are honest, that such laws simply do not exist. So he's saying there is no rock-hard foundation, there's no objective truth to morality if there is no God. Okay, last one, just to drive home this point, a guy by the name of Julian Beguini, um, 
wrote a book called Atheism, A Very Short Introduction. He wrote this, if there is no single moral authority, i.e., if there is no God, then we have to, to, in some sense, create values for ourselves. Okay? That means that moral claims are not true or false in the same way as factual claims are. Moral claims are judgments that it is always possible for someone to disagree with without saying something that is factually false. You may disagree with me, but you can't say I made a factual error. In other words, what he's saying is we can open those doors and feel that cold wind and say objectively there is wind blowing into the church. Does that make sense? And if you say there is no wind blowing into the church, well, now you've made a factual error. Does that make sense? Or two plus two is five. You made a factual error. Does that make sense? So he's saying morality isn't like that. When you take God out of the picture, morality is opinion-based. You might say I, I'm, I, my opinion is different than yours, but you can't say I am wrong. Does that make sense? So then who becomes the moral foundation of morality? Isn't it us? We become the moral foundation of morality. It's no longer God, and it's no longer outside of us. It's not something that is for everyone, but rather me in my moment. Now, the thing is, as I've had these conversations with people, as I've engaged with conversations in morality, um, I've had people talk in one of, respond in one of two ways. Um, they either say, well, it's evolution, and that's usually the first part, that we have developed these um, moral, this morals over eons, and we have done this or over you know, thousands of years. We've created these morals. Now, for that, I want to read you a quote from a guy named Richard Dawkins. Now, Dawkins, if you don't know who he is, he's an atheist and a pretty, I would say, an evangelism for, an evangelist for atheists, okay? Um, he is actually part of what they call, the, he and these three other guys named themselves, called the Four Horsemen of Atheism, okay? Listen to what he said. He wrote this book called The Selfish Gene, okay? And this is what he said at the, in the very first chapter. Much as we might wish to believe otherwise, universal love, and the welfare of the species as a whole are concepts which simply do not make evolutionary sense. So in other words, morality doesn't make sense for the evolutionary process. And within that book, he really um, goes after this idea of selfishness. And he doesn't use it in a way that is derogatory. He uses it in a way that we're self-preserving ourselves. Right, that we are focused on self-preservation. And so this idea that we do things not because they're morally good, but rather because they help me. Right? So why, why would I not lie to you? Well, it's not because lying is bad, but rather because if I lie to you, then we wouldn't have a good, con uh, a good relationship so that we could stand to get something. Does that make sense? So that idea that morality is there, it, he's saying, is not an evolutionary thing. So then, what is it? Well, usually in the conversation I've had, it goes to, well, that just you shouldn't do certain things just because you shouldn't do those. Well, I love it because if, you, if you've ever read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, he responds to this. This is what he says. He says, if we ask, why ought I be unselfish, and you reply, because it is good for society, you may then ask, why should I care what is good for society, except when it happens to pay me personally? And then you'll have to say, because you ought to be unselfish, which simply brings us back to where we started. You are saying what is true, but you are not getting any further. It goes back to the idea of, is murder wrong? Well, when most people I have a conversation, and that gets brought up, I'm like, the majority of people say no. I mean, the majority of people say, yes, murder is wrong. Right? I mean, how many of us would say in here that no, murder is good? By a show of hands. All depends, right, when you're, you're dealing with that person at the DMV. <laughs> right? And, but the thing is, is we tend to agree on those things. Yeah, I ought not to be unselfish. But why? It's that kid question. Right? 
but it gets to the complexities of this. Why should I be unselfish? Why should I not lie? Why should I not murder? What is the basis of that? And if it's based on our own opinion, then guess what? We're just going to keep going in this circle because the reality is our opinions change. Society changes, right? If we think back, think back to when you were a teenager, all right? Did you have a cell phone? No. Now, it was pretty cool that you thought about in your car to have something that would pass by the miles, right? You're like, okay, I'm driving in this car, and I would really like something to do, right? But we didn't ha you didn't have cell phones. I didn't have a cell phone either. But that idea, today we do. We have the Internet. So our society, the needs of our society change, right? Now, the basis of morality, if, if morals come from a transcendent God, then those morals are for every generation. But if we base it on society's need, then the needs 50 years ago are not the needs today. And the needs 50 years from now are not going to be the needs today. So our morals have to change with those needs. But then there's a problem. What's good? What's right? It's not based on something that we can't, we can't say murder is wrong. Because our foundation says that we can't say it. And so that's what we're talking about here. You know, it's really funny. Um, I stumbled upon this, uh, this, it was an article back in 2017 um, by the, the, it was the Nature of Human Behavior Journal. Uh, you can go online. It's on nat I think it's called nature.com or something like that. I'm going to have all these um, quotes on our website uh, later on this week. Um, but anyways, in this thing, they asked the question. Um, they would ask the question, and then they would say, simple. Uh, this person killed a dog. What are they? Are they religious or are they atheists? And across the board, doesn't matter the society, doesn't matter if the society was a religious society or a, a, an atheist or a secular society with a majority of atheists, they all responded with atheists being the ones that killed the dog, or they, mostly. And from that, the idea came that even other atheists looked at atheists and said, your morals aren't concrete. And so I don't think that you would be moral. Now, is that true? I don't know. But that's the perception of someone that doesn't have a foundation that is solid in morality. Where the religious people have a solid understanding that there is a morality that ex extends past ourselves. But the atheist says, no, the morality is just here. And then what ends up happening? So right before the teenagers took off, and this is a weird Sunday for me. This is the first Sunday in 13 years that I've been here when the teens are in, at winter camp. So this is a weird feeling. I was walking around lost today. Yeah. So I actually thought yesterday was Friday. I almost slept in today. So, um, but I, right before they left, I had one of our teenagers come to me. His name's Carl. And we've been having a lot of theological and philosophical discussions. Um, and he comes to me right before they leave. We're talking 10 minutes before they leave. What are your thoughts on communism, not, religion not being in society, and the implications of that? <laughs> and it's like, thank you, Carl. <laughs> um, and so I approached it like this. Let's look at it from the standpoint of application actual application, right? If we look into the societies that have been focused, like they have said, we are atheistic societies. So that would be like Russia, the communist Russia, right? They, Stalin and um, uh, Vladimir, uh, Lenin, um, they actually said, we are atheists and we are conducting our society as an atheistic society. So let's just look at that. Every single one has put that the powerful, the ones that gain power, suppress those who don't have power. And their morals are whatever is self 
gratifying or whatever is self-preservation. And so we actually see, if put into practice, these teachings. That morality becomes based on the person and what they want rather than what's good for society. And so that was like done in 10 minutes. It's like, okay, now go, Carl, get out of here. You know, but that's it because, and then what happens? When a new regime comes in, what's, what's right, what's wrong? Well, the regime has to decide that, right? And then they implement it. And so this idea that it's ever shifting, that morality is constantly shifting, how can you have a society that does that, right? If, if the society doesn't know that lying is wrong, then how do I go and I have business dealings with someone? I can't because I never know, right? I never know if that person's going to lie and stab me in the back. There's a book called The Promised Child. Um, it's done by a, a missionary. And it's, he tells this story about how he goes into this, uh, this, this group, this tribe, and he's trying to share Jesus. And he's telling them about the story, uh, the fall, um, how we are sinners. Jesus comes down to save us. Um, he is betrayed by Judas, and he goes to the cross, he dies, and he resurrects. And the whole time, the people around him are, are saying, well, Judas is the great guy in this story. He is the hero of the story. And he came to find out that within the society, it was believed that if you could get someone to trust you and then able to stab them in the back, you were a great person within the society. Now, how do you live in a society like that where you can never trust someone? You know, and so this idea of morality shifting, because, and it's not good for society. We can't say whatever is good for society because it's constantly moving. The target is moving. The field post is moving. And so, but Jesus says this, and I, I'm really interested that he says this thing. And so, yeah, so without God, moral foundations are based on us, right? On the finite human beings, okay? And morality, that means that morality actually gives us a good basis for an argument for God. And I'm going to share with you why in a couple minutes. But before that, I want to take you to um, Matthew chapter 7. And I just want to read to you verses 24 through 27. Listen what Jesus says. Now, he's using this um, as his whole of all of his teachings, okay? And he says this. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. Now, we're, we're um, remodeling a house right now. Um, we're getting in preparing for the youth pastor to come. And that rain yesterday, I thought the rain, it says rain in course. I'm like, okay, it's going to sprinkle. And that thing just came down. So I'm like, oh, I better get over to the house real quick. We had some people visiting, so I showed them the house. And I'm looking around, <laughs> like, did anything go wrong? And there was some wet underneath, but the, the studs weren't wet. So they didn't come from above. It came from below. So just, anyways. Um, but the foundation was good. I'm like, yes, everything's good for the most part. It needs some silicone. But anyways, um, but this is Jesus. He's saying, if you base your lives on me, it's solid, right? There is no shifting. But then he goes on to say, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And we're seeing in our society a moving away from biblical morality, away from God being our moral foundation. And we're seeing this, this shifting and this crashing of society, right? And so this is a huge thing. But going back to that idea that the moral argument gives us a reason for why God exists doesn't come from me. I want to share with you another um, quote from Richard Dawkins. Now, this was done, um, Time International. Um, they were doing this kind of, it wasn't a roundtable discussion. It was just two people sitting down, and there was a moderator, and they were just talking. It wasn't a debate. They were just talking. 
And it was Richard Dawkins on one side, and it was this guy named Francis Collins, who was a scientist, on the other. And they were just talking. Listen to one of the things that Richard Dawkins says. They get into morality, and he says, The moral law is a reason to think God as plausible. Now, listen, that is Richard Dawkins, the atheist, calls himself one of the four horsemen of the new atheists. This guy is not nice to Christians, okay? Not just, and he goes on to say, not just a God who sets the universe in motion. That's what we talked about last week, a God who creates the universe. So he says the moral law doesn't just show us that there's a God who sets it in motion, but a God who cares about human beings, this is a personal God because we seem uniquely, he's talking about humans, uniquely amongst the creatures on the planet to have this far developed sense of morality. So he's saying that we, have, we having morality actually can point us to God. Now he says, I reject that. But he's saying that is, makes God plausible. So in the last two weeks, we've talked about two things that give arguments for the existence of God. The fact that we can, we're here, right? And the fact that we can say this is right and this is wrong. And so these two ideas point us to the existence of God. That we can say God exists. Now the question becomes, who is that God, Right? Now, the God of the Bible says, I am the creator. We talked about that last week. The God of the Bible also says, says, I am the one from whom goodness comes. And the psalmist, in Psalm 34, um, he looks at God and he has experienced God, and so he calls other people to experience that goodness of God, the goodness that flows out of him. So Psalm 34, I want to read it for you. Psalm 34, verse 8, this is what it says. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. This is experience God's goodness. He says, Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days... Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. This is a moral God. This is a God that says, these things are good, and these things are evil. And there's no, there's no in-between in that. In the sense of God's not over here going, you know, sometimes this is okay. And sometimes this is not. No, he says these are the good things and these are the evil things. And what's really interesting, and I, I've had this conversation with many people, and we actually talked about this. During the summertime, we go through one book of the Bible. This past year, it was Joshua. And within the book of Joshua, there's this situation where Rahab, um, this woman, lies to save the people. And the conversation always goes this way when talking about that. Well, God didn't condemn her. You know, she was actually saved by God. So lying in certain cir circumstances is okay. In that circumstance, God never says that what she did was right either. And at the same time, she wasn't a follower of God. She knew of God, and she thought, well, this God, you know, he's going to do some stuff here. And she was trying to save herself. But she was never a follower of God at that point. It wasn't until afterwards that God saved her. And that's a great thing of God, too, that he's also merciful. Even in, and we talked about this, even in our sin, he's still willing to save us. So that's that loving, personal God. But he still calls evil, evil, and good, good. Because goodness comes from him. And evil are those things that are not of him. And so this is a clear thing. So for us, as Christians, we can say, morality is based not on me. 
Because if it was based on me when I got up in the morning, what, however I slept, my morality would change. If I didn't get a good breakfast, my morality would change. If I'm not getting my way, my morality would change. If it's based on me, but if it's based on God, then no matter what, that person that cut me off, I still have to love them. Because my morality is not based on me. Because you know what I want to do with them? I want to chase them down. That's what I want to do. You know, but it's based on who God is. And so I am to conform to him. That means that no matter where I go, no matter what I do, evil is still evil and good is still good. It's not based on the shifting of my emotions, on the shifting of society, the shifting of my opinions. And the atheists, they understand that. They understand that it's like that. And so um, that Luke um, Mühlhauser, the first guy I talked about, he actually now has to deal with, and he talks about this on his website, has to deal with now where does his morality come from? Because he still believes that morality is objective, that it does come from somewhere. And so he has to now find that place because he doesn't want to find it in God. And so now he has to struggle through that. But in the end, like the other ones, he finds it in his own person. And so this week, I want to, I want to challenge you to do this. As you go, as I did last week, I want to challenge you to, con- to go and research the moral argument. We just hit the, the very bottom of it. Right? We just talked about what, what is the foundation, but there is more to this argument. And so I want to challenge you to go deeper into it. If you have never read Mere Christianity, that's a great place to start. It's a very simple, very short book that talks about it. And if you're not into reading, go on YouTube and type in the little search bar to C.S. Lewis Doodles. I love it. Have you seen it? Yeah. It's great. This guy, he puts on, someone reads through one of C.S. Lewis' works, and he just draws it. And it's great because it, it engages your eyes and your ears. Uh, YouTube, C.S. Lewis Doodles. D-O-O-D-L-E-S. I think that's how you spell doodles. If it's not, it's close enough. You have a, a, a thing that fixes mistakes so there you go um so yeah so go do that dig into this moral argument because i'll tell you what as you dig into it you're going to see god's hand and how he arranges everything and his goodness and as you do i want to encourage you to taste and see the goodness of god to really go in and say god i just don't want to understand your goodness i want to experience it i want to taste and see that you are good but as I told the, the, um, the group before, I always view experiencing God like this. We're in a dark room. Okay, so you have to imagine this. You're in a dark room, completely void of any light, except for one candle in the very center of the room. And as you standing there, and you've been like this your whole life, so as you stand there, you don't feel different. But as you walk towards that candle, you look at your hands and you start seeing, oh man, I got some dirt on me. And I brush it off. And as I get closer, there's more dirt and there's more. And this is how I see us getting closer to God. As we go closer to God, his light, his goodness shows our sin. And instead of saying, instead of drawing back into the darkness, we say, God, cleanse me. Get rid of that dirt. So as we experience God's goodness, we go deeper into the light. And we say, God, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So that's why I want to challenge you to do this week. Go and search and understand the moral argument deeper. And go to God and say, God, I want to experience your goodness. And if there's any sin in me, cleanse me of that. Because you are a good God. And I want to be your follower. Sound good? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. I thank you for your people. I want to pray, especially right now, though, for those that aren't here, that they're, they're driving, um, 
they've already taken off to, to snowy worlds and they're, um, Lord, I pray for their safe travel. Lord, I pray for our teens as they're going to be coming back right now, that you protect them. Lord, I pray for those that are sick in our midst right now, that you would be with them. Lord, we know that you do good because you are good. And we can come before you and ask you for good things because you are good. Lord, I thank you that we can do this. That you as a father wrap us in your arms and bring us into your lap. And that we can request anything of you because you're a good God. Lord, I pray for your people right now. I pray for myself that we would this week not only engage into this argument to see your goodness even greater, but also that we would experience your goodness. Lord, I pray for everyone in here that they would taste and see that you are good and they would experience you in a new and deeper way this week. Lord, help us. Lord, cleanse us by your spirit of anything that is in us that is not called by you. So, Father, I thank you that you are good. I thank you that you save us through Jesus. And I thank you, you indwell us by your spirit. So, Father, I thank you. In your son's name I pray, amen. There came a sound from heaven Like a rushing mighty wind It
All right, so we're going to take a, an offering right now. So if I could have the guys come on up. Uh, one of the things that um, I want us to understand as we take an offering, because um, there's a lot of different uh, denominations, a lot of different backgrounds from the Christian, uh, from Christianity here represented. Um, we could probably take a slice and get five or six different denominations, which is fantastic because we are one church, right? We are beyond denominations. We are one church. Um, and so, but one of the things we like to say is that we are worshiping not just, like I said, not just with each other, but with the whole of God's people. And so, but this time, this time of offering is a worshipful time. We want to make sure that this is a part of worship. It's giving back to God. But I want to put in a little caveat. If you don't feel led to give, don't give. The reason is, is because if you give, and it's not because you want to give, or you feel led to give, then that's not worship. And so I, we need to worship, right? We need to worship. So don't give if you're like, well, I don't feel God giving to me. That's perfectly okay. You don't even have to put your hand as if you're putting something in. <laughs> okay? You don't even have to do that. It's all right. Because God is glorified even if you don't give. Because you worship him. All right? Let's pray for this. Heavenly Father, thank you for your people. I thank you for their worship. I thank you that you provide all needs. I thank you for the fact that we get to sing, not just with each other, but we get to sing with our brothers and sisters down the road, across this um, county, across this nation, across this world, that we get to worship with them, and we are lifting up you. Lord, use this offering not to build the alliance but rather to build your church. So, Father, that's our desire. Help us keep that as our focal point. Lord, thank you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Stand with us, please, singing when we all get to heaven, because that's where we're going, right? Hopefully. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy.
so very much. Drive safe. Thank you, Jody, Moana, and Margaret. All right, have a great week. God bless you. The Foresters are tonight at 6, so come on out. Um, brave the, the harsh winters of Quartzsite to come on out. All right, God bless you. Live in victory. <laughs>